right into the next aspect of this man of one. And it comes to us in Daniel, first of all, where we're really basing our, uh, our thoughts together. Daniel chapter 10, in verse 6, his face is as the appearance of a lightning. And so we have that idea of the appearance of lightning, but it's his face. And of course, the Hebrew word for face is panim, it's plural. It's the faces, which of course reminds us of the cherubim, but that's the way it always is. Um, and it's the idea of presence. So the presence is as the appearance of lightning. And the word appearance is the word marah, which means the sight, the vision, the phenomenon, the spectacle. Uh, this is the, what you're looking at when you see this man. And it's the appearance of lightning, which is Strong's number 1300, the word Barak, which is kind of one of those onomatopoeias, like, you know, you think of Barak, the big crack of lightning in the sky. And uh, here it is, it's lightning, flashes, um, the flashes of an arrowhead, or a flashing arrowhead, or the idea of a glittering sword. So that's the idea that's expressed to us in this appearance, uh, this countenance, like lightning. So just uh, taking a quick cruise from the Tigris over to the Isle of Patmos in the Mediterranean, we have now John's description of it in uh, Revelation chapter 1. In coming in at verse 16, it says, His countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. So when you look at that and you say, okay, well, let's just look at these words as well to help expand our, our understanding of this. The first of them is this idea of countenance which is the Greek word opsis, meaning the seeing or the sight. It's the idea of the outward appearance. So this is what we look at when we see somebody. His outward appearance is like the sun, which is the Greek word helios, of course, and it can mean the sun or rays of the sun or the idea of the light of the day. And it's described as shining, which is the Greek word, word phaino, which is related, of course, to the word phanerosis, the idea of to bring forth into the light, to cause something to shine, to shed light, to be bright or resplendent. But it's the sun that is shining in its strength, which is the word dunamis, which is the idea of the power, the ability, the inherent power that resides in something by virtue of its nature is sort of the idea. Um, the power that somebody exerts or puts forth. So that's sort of just the, the words that are used in both uh, Daniel and in John's description of this creature, uh, this man of one. Now, it's used elsewhere in Scripture. It's not this is the only place that we see this. It comes up in the visions of the cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 1. Because we read there in verse 4, it says, I looked... And behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, and a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And it's, there was a brightness about it. And that's the same idea. And out of the midst thereof was the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. We looked at amber yesterday, is that electrum, the brightness of the brass, or the shining brass. And, of course, this is the appearance of the cherubim, but notice what it says. Their appearance they had was the likeness of a man. So it tells you right away that these are similar visions. They're not disjointed one from the other. But the other interesting thing is if you come down to chapter 10, because Ezekiel sees this vision first of all in chapter 1, and then as we looked at, he was plucked out of his home and taken all the way to Jerusalem in chapter 8, and that vision continues chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. So in chapter 10, he's in Jerusalem, He's taken to the temple, he sees the cherubim that depart, and they depart to the east, and they go, of course, to the Mount of Olives. And it says there in chapter 10 and verse 4, the glory of Yahweh went up from the cherub, stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of Yahweh's glory. And eventually that glory would depart to the Mount of Olives, which, interestingly enough, is where the Lord Jesus Christ would depart out of Jerusalem too and leave from the Mount of Olives. So he, of course, being the brightness of the Father. So that's kind of one of the Old Testament times when we get a glimpse of this. 
it comes up, as some of you noticed yesterday, uh, we were talking about the, the, uh, the garments, and you said, well, I wonder why you didn't use the transfiguration there. Well, this is why, because it kind of fits this one a little bit uh, as well. And that's Matthew 17, verses 1 to 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brought them into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as was white as light. Right, So you have both of those characteristics there. His face is shining as the sun, and his uh, countenance, or his raiment, sorry, is as white as the light. So that's the idea we get. So it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is uh, typically shown here in glory. Of course, he's there with Moses and with Elijah. Well, Peter comments on this, and he tells us that, look, we were there with him in the mount. Remember, we looked at this at the beginning of our class on Kors and Bethsaida, Galilee, the Gentiles. We haven't followed cunningly devised fables, said Peter. This isn't a bunch of made-up stories or myths. But, he says, we were there. So he says in, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, we made known unto you, he describes it as the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This wasn't stories. He says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So he was anointed, so to speak, as we were talking about in our discussion, with honor and glory at this point in time. And notice that it's, they were eyewitnesses of his, of his majesty, and it's the power of his coming. So that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is described as. But it's, it's more than that, young people and brothers and sisters. It's not just uh, the moral, uh, or sorry, the, the physical brightness. It also represents to us the moral brightness of the character. Because all of these things we're looking at, yes, there's a physical side to it, and there's burnished brass, and it sparkles brightly, but there's also this idea of a moral character to that. So when we look at the different elements, we look at the spiritual characteristics we have to develop. So come, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. Because Colossians 3 is describing for us the moral development each and every one of us has to go through. Remember we talked about that passage in John? We know that when he appears, we shall be like him. So how do we end up being shining brightly like this? Um, it's not just a change of our nature, although that certainly will be part of it down the road. Well, if you look at Hebrew, or Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 5 to 9, in order to be qualified for this, we first of all have to put to death the, the old man, and that's why we have the brazen feet and so on and so forth. It has to be put through tribulation. So, verse 5, mortify therefore your members which are on the earth, and he lists them off. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness. And you say, know, so, well, well, the first one's there, we, we don't have a problem with those, but hmm, we hit covetousness. He says, that's equivalent to idolatry. And which of us doesn't like the other person's trailer a little bit more than ours, you know? So um, that's one of these things we're all struck with. So he says, for which things sake the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked when you lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing you've put off the old man and his deeds. And we looked at this in Romans 6, right? It's about the baptismal process. It's not just going into the water, it's coming out. So we read in Romans 6, verse 4 the other day, therefore we are baptized with him, or buried with him, with him by baptism into death, like as the Father was raised up from the dead by, or sorry, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. So when we're talking about the glory that the Apostle Peter says was bestowed upon him, 
anointed with it, so to speak, in the garden, or sorry, in the Mount of Transfiguration, when we're talking about glory, it is tied to our walk. Glory and the walk in newness of life. Like as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so paralleling that, we have to walk in newness of life. So that's what is laid out for us as a challenge. So a quick little review. We know this stuff. This is like going back to Sunday school for a minute here. But I just want to kind of run through this because sometimes we know it, but we don't see the forest for the trees. So, um, oh, sorry, I missed a slide here. This is the other side to it then. So the walk um, is to put on. So this is uh, verse 10 to 16. So not only do we put off the other stuff, but we put on the new man, which is, and notice the wording here, renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So what are we supposed to do? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man hath a quarrel against you, just as Christ forgave you, uh, also do ye. And above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are called in one body. See, if you want to be part of the man of one, these are the characteristics we've got to be showing. We've got to mortify the old man and his deeds, get rid of all that stuff, and we've got to be developing and cultivating these characteristics. You see, the works of the flesh are simple. It's stuff we do. It's natural to us. The fruits of the Spirit have to be cultivated. I've been learning that this year because we put a garden in. You know, you can't just sort of throw it in and let it go. You have to cultivate it. You've got to turn the soil over. You've got to fertilize it. You actually have to water the thing once in a while. And then you have to, not in Brantford lately, it just waters itself. But, and then you have to pull out all those weeds and you've got to get rid of the bugs and you've got, to, you've got to cultivate it. And that's what we have to do. How do we do that? By letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom. So that's the treasure that's got to be in our golden zone. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto Yahweh, or sorry, unto the Lord, sorry. And so that's the idea that we have. So now let's take that and, and push that into, sort of run through this idea of what this means, this idea of the glory of God. We know from the point of view of our Sunday school lessons, what the Bible teaches us. We ask our kids, well, what's the purpose of God with the earth? And we're told, Isaiah 45, um, verse 18, thus saith Yahweh that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth, he made it, he established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am Yahweh, there's none else. So God has a purpose with the earth. So he's not gonna let it all blow up. He's not gonna let it be destroyed uh, by mankind. Um, recycling isn't going to save it, although it might help. Um, you know, it's going to be used for a purpose, right? This is what God is all about. He formed it to be inhabited. So then it begs the question, well, inhabited by what? And of course, we know the answer, Habakkuk 2.14, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. And the word there for uh, knowledge is the Hebrew word yada which means to know intimately. It's not like having a surface level, you know, I mean, I often use this with, with my son, he's 13. If you asked him, do you know how to drive a car? He'd say, sure, I know how to drive a car. I know I've seen it done. You know, you put the key in, you turn it, boom, engine magically starts, right? And then you move that stick thing backwards and forwards. You put it into drive if you want to go forward, reverse if you want to go backwards, neutral if you want to go nowhere, and you press on the gas and it goes. And you hit the brake and it stops. I know how to drive a car. Would I go with him? Would I let him drive my car? Not a chance. Because he's got theoretical knowledge, but he doesn't have yada knowledge, which is experiential knowledge. And this is what God says to us. The earth is going to be filled with the experiential knowledge of Yahweh. It's the knowledge of actually who he is. And so that, of course, when we come to Moses, in Exodus 33 is his question. He says to God, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, I may yada thee, 
Moses wants to know, he wants to know by experience, who is God? Show me your ways, he says. And then he rephrases the question um, in verse 18. He says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. So that tells us that his ways and his glory are the same thing. And then he asks, or the answer to his question is given in chapter 34, verse 5. Yahweh descends in a cloud and proclaims his name. And that name is a list of characteristics. So when you look at that, you say, okay, this is a pretty important thing. We have to know the ways of God, the name of God, and not just pronouncing it and when, but what it means. And that character, and it's not just knowing it academically, but it means to know it by experience. Okay, so is it important that we do that? It is absolutely important that we do it. In fact, our eternal life depends on it. Because the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in John chapter 17, verse 3, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now that's first principle stuff. It's basic stuff, but it helps us to remind ourselves. The word know here is 3799. It's the, uh, the Greek uh, nisko or gnisko, and it means to understand, to perceive, or to have an intimate knowledge of. So I want you to turn up um, first of John chapter 2, because this is where we sort of have this, this litmus test. So we say, okay, we're Christadelphians. We've grown up in the truth, uh, or we've been brought into the truth. We've been instructed. Um, we know who God is. Um, we got that one down packed, no problem. We can rhyme off to you all the names and titles, perhaps, of the deity, maybe even pronounced incorrectly, unlike me, and then I can tell you what they all mean. That's not the litmus test of what it means to know God. What it means to know God is given to us in 1st of John, chapter 2, in verse 3. Hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. If I say I know him, and I keep not his commandments, I'm a liar, and the truth is not in me. But whoso keepeth his word, in him very is the, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him, know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself so to walk, even as he walked. That's what it means to know God. It means that we keep his commandments, walk the way that he walked. It's not just to know what we should be doing, it's to be doing what we should be doing. And so if we were to just sort of summarize this for a moment and go through these concepts, we've kind of gone through just a bunch of first principles. The first thing we learned is that God's purpose is to fill the earth with his glory. So his purpose is his glory. And then we found out that the glory of God is equivalent to his name. Well, then we found out as well that his name is his character, because that's what he lists off, is all those characteristics. And it's interesting how he starts that, too. It's the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, you know, long-suffering, and so on and so forth, abundant in goodness and truth. But he starts with mercy. And brothers and sisters, why does God start with mercy? Because that concept is foreign to us as human beings. In fact, God even tells us that, because I think it's Micah, where he's talking about Ephraim. He says, I haven't destroyed Ephraim, although I should have, he says, because I'm God and not man. I'm merciful. And we use that as a proof verse for the Trinity. See, God isn't man, right? But what he also tells us is, I have the character of mercy. Now, mercy is not permissiveness. There's a difference there. It doesn't just mean anything goes. Mercy is different than permissiveness. And sometimes we get that mixed up and we say, well, we're going to be merciful to somebody and we're just permissive. Well, that's not helping them at all. That's a different thing. But just make sure we get that clear in our mind. So his name is his character. We also learn that knowing God is essential for eternal life. If we're going to be living forever, we must know God. The two things cannot be without being side by side. Knowing God is equivalent to keeping his commandments or his word. And his commandment, brothers and sisters, is to love our brother. 
And that comes to us in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 23. So let's just look at that for a moment. When we look at this concept, this is the new commandment, he says, in 1 John, it actually comes up in chapter 2 as well. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, he says, A new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is past. Now notice the phrasing here. The true light now shineth. But what is, we, what is the characteristic we're looking at? His brightness, his face, his countenance is shining as the sun. And he says, this is the true light that is now shining. So that's the idea that's laid out. He that saith he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even till now. He that loves his brother and abides in, abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. So, brothers and sisters, if we want to be part of the man of one, it's imperative, absolutely imperative. There is no choice. We must love our brother. If we say that we're in the light, but we don't, we're lying. We're absolutely out to lunch. We're in darkness. So that's the situation. And we're told, he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and he walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because he's in darkness. Uh, the darkness has blinded his eyes. So we've got to figure out, brothers and sisters, what exactly are we all about? Are we about walking in the light? Are we about manifesting the character of our God? Are we about having that character working in our lives? So then when we come into a problem, it's not what do you think or what do I think? I don't care what you think and you shouldn't care what I think. What saith the scripture? And that's what we've got to do. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this words, because there's no light in them. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. So this is the principles on which this whole idea of the light has to be built upon. So we think of 1 John 3 then, in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. This is what we're looking forward to. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are ye the sons of God. This isn't something that we just get come the kingdom age. It's now. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And brothers and sisters, just let's drive this point home to ourselves. And I say that to ourselves, because it's me, as much as it is you, to recognize that what he says in the book of Revelation, in chapter 22, his last few words to us, in verse 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. We're not going to get mystically changed come the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not like then this character flaw that I've not dealt with my whole life is somehow just going to fairy dust get dealt with. No, that's what we're here now for. That's what the furnace burning going on all around us is for. So that we get rid of the dross out of our lives. And so what we've got to do is be the sons of God now. This picture we're looking at is one like the son of man. So we have to develop that in our lives now. So we have to say, it says there... Everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. So if I find in me there is a root of bitterness springing up, if I'm harboring some hatred in my heart for a brother or for a sister or something that maybe they did or something that maybe they said that has offended me or whatever else and I'm just holding on to that and just gnawing away at it, now is the time to purge these feelings out and get rid of them. And if you've got a problem with them, do what you're told. Go talk to them. Never mind talking to everybody else. This person did this and that and the other. Oh, that's nice. You know, go talk to them and clear it up. It could well be that you've taken it wrong. You might be 100% right and they didn't realize that they'd done that. And they're very repentant of that. But we've got to deal with these things now, walking in the light and purifying ourselves. 
And this is, of course, what it means to be part of the man of one. It's the idea of manifesting the life of Christ in us right now. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that's the lamb-like quality, that the life of Jesus might also be manifest in our body, fanaru, right? Which is right close to that word of shining, to shine out that's in the book of Revelation. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So we have to shine that out, brothers and sisters, now. In both the positive, and in our view sometimes negative, although it's not negative, characteristics. The goodness and the severity of God. We're talking with the young people about God's goodness and severity. We're looking at Ruth, and we have that little passage there, under whose wings thou art come to trust. So we go to Matthew, and we look at the Lord Jesus Christ says, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. How often I would take you and gather you as a hen does her chicks under her wings, and you wouldn't have it. So he says, instead, there's going to come a nation against you as swift as the eagle flies. It's going to rip your carcass to shreds. Your choice, under the wings of protection or the eagles. They both have wings. They're both birds. They're both characteristics of God. What will you want? And that's our choice, brothers and sisters. What character do we want to see? Do we want to see the goodness? Or do we want to see the severity? It's our call. Both of them are there. And if we won't have his love and protection and won't listen to him, stay tuned because you're going to get severity. Because that's how he's going to teach us if we won't listen to his word. And so this is what we have to do. So our moral countenance then must be shining now. This is a picture of a city um, in Italy, I think it is, but kind of gives you an idea. Um, in a dark night, the Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick or a lampstand, that it might give light to all that are in the house. So what's the exhortation to us? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uncle Len used to say, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And that's the truth, brothers and sisters. Telling people what to do doesn't help. I mean, it's part of it. Showing them what to do is what it's all about. That's letting our light shine before men. That's what we have to do. And the thing is, brothers and sisters, is all coming out anyway. Come the judgment seat, everything is going to be revealed. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and at verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether he's done good or bad. And the word there for appear is that word fanaru, to make manifest, 5319. It means to make visible or known, to show what has been formerly hidden, to make plainly recognized and thoroughly understood what one really is. That's what's about to happen to every single one of us. Are you ready for that? Am I ready for that? Take off my tie, my Sunday jacket, and take a look inside and see what really is going on in Jonathan Bowen. See what's really going on in your mind and in your heart. Because you see, this is the God that we deal with. This is what's going to happen. Everything is going to be revealed in its time. And he goes on to tell us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and at verse 5, I know nothing by myself, he says, yet I am uh, not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Why? What's the Lord going to do? Well, he's going to bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest, which is Fanaru again, the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. And brothers and sisters, this goes on now. And it's the grace of God that it does. Because sometimes there are things in our lives that we just can't deal with on our own. A sin that's going on and it's eating away at us and eating away at us. And God brings us time and time again different things to try and help us deal with that. 
But it's in his grace we told that, you know, some men's sins are known beforehand, right? And if we can't deal with it, out of love, he will open it up and expose it. We'll look at this in our class tomorrow. So sometimes if we don't deal with an issue in our private life, God will bring it into the light and engage the collective conscience that will then help to deal with that. This is his mercy preparing us because he's not willing that anybody should perish. And so again, if we want to be part of this man of one, we have to engage in the preparation process now because it's all coming out at the judgment seat anyway. So we may as well expose it now and deal with it. The beauty is, brothers and sisters, that the destiny of the saints is to be children of the light. Uh, we think of the words, of, uh, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Malachi chapter 4 and verses 2 to 3. To you that fear my name, sorry I went too far, to you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise, problem with these things sometimes. You that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you will go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in that day, that I shall do this, saith Yahweh of hosts. So that's Malachi 4 verses 2 to 3. So the Son of Righteousness, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief of the man of one, the head of the man of one, is going to arise with healing in his wings or his beams. And they're going to shine out over all the world. This is his manifestation in the kingdom age to come. Now it's not just a physical manifestation, although that will be part of it, but it's a manifestation based on a glorious character that has been developed, that we read of all the way through the New Testament. And the same destiny is there for the saints as well. We read in Luke chapter 1 and verse 78, Though a tender, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring on on high has visited us. So this is the Lord. And the word for day spring there is the word Anatole, which means the sun's rising. And so Jesus turns around and he says, Look, you're going to be involved in this. In Matthew 19, 28, Verily I say unto you, you which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, when he is glorified as the Son of Righteousness that arise in healing with his wings, you're going to be there, sitting on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is a concept that's carried throughout the Bible. It's there in the book of Revelation, in chapter 16. And verse 12, where we read, the sixth angel pours out his vial on the great river Euphrates. Well, that's the time period we live in. That the waters thereof may be dried up. Why? That the way of the kings of the sun's rising might be prepared. Now, some people get that all confused. Say, kings of the east must be the Chinese. You know, that's 20 million Chinese coming. Hal Lindsey and all these guys. Now, that's not what it means. It's the sun's rising, which is that same word, Anatole. And that's why, of course, Brother Thomas writes Exposition of Daniel, and he called it Anatolia. Right? That was the original title of it, picked up on this whole phrase. And this is the destiny of the saints. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. They that be wise will shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. So that, brothers and sisters, is the destiny of the saints, to shine as the brightness of the firmament. It's put this way in Matthew chapter 9, or 13, verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is what it means, brothers and sisters, to be part of that man of one. This is what it means to have a countenance that shines like the sun in its strength. It does mean that we will be immortalized, yes. But it also means that we, have, we are immortalized because we are a reflection of the glory of the Father, fulfilling his purpose and being involved in fulfilling that purpose in others. This, of course, is what Peter's referring to in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, where he says, a new heavens and a new earth are coming. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what type of people ought we to be 
in all holy conversation or lifestyle and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, when the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements will be melted with fervent heat, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. That's what's going to rule over the kingdom. The son of righteousness and those who are righteous with him. Not their own righteousness. They have been preparing, but it's been granted to the lamb's wife to be clothed in a robe of righteousness. Now let's just go back into 2 Samuel. Turn this one up because it's interesting that when David talks about the ruler that is supposed to come, he uses language just like this. So this is 2 Samuel 23, and at verse 2, we read there, The Spirit of Yahweh spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The Rock of Israel spake to me. And what did he tell David? He that ruleth over men must be just. Ruling in the fear of God. So that's the qualification. If you want to be in the kingdom, a king and a priest, you must be just, ruling in the fear of God. He shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. And he says, although my house be not so with God, yet he has made this covenant with me. Of course it wasn't. You had Absalom and Amnon and Adonijah, and even Solomon didn't turn out exactly the way he wanted it, but he knew that what God had promised he was able to perform. So it's going to be like the light, the light of the day, the daybreak, the dawning. It's the morning light. It's where let there be light, Genesis 1, verse 3. This is the idea. And as the sun that riseth, which is zarah, which means to rise, to break forth, and it's a clear shining or a brightness. This is exactly what we're looking at in the man of one. So if we want to be part of the man of one, if we want to rule over men in the kingdom age, and we want to be part of the new heavens and the new earth, then this is the kind of people we have to be. These are the qualifications for the new heavens and the new earth. What does God tell us? Righteous Yahweh loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Psalm 11, verse 7. Psalm 37, verse 30. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. His tongue talketh of judgment. Proverbs 21, 15. It is joy to the just to do judgment, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. Proverbs 4, verse 18. The path of light, sorry, uh, the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. So all of these passages tell us that this is the kind of people that God wants for his kingdom. And that, of course, is the picture we have of the dawning of the kingdom age. In Isaiah 60 and verse 1, we're told, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of Yahweh is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, Gross darkness the people, but Yahweh shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. This is the rising of Israel's son, presided over by Christ and the saints. They are that lampstand of the future age, and their righteousness will go forth, like ours is supposed to be today. We're supposed to be the light of the world shining forth the resilient splendor of the character of God. In the kingdom age, their job will be to do the same. So much so that ten men will take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, we will go with you because we've heard that God is with you. And it's obvious, they can see it. And so we ask the question, brothers and sisters, well, who is it then that enters into the kingdom of God? Who is it that gets to go in in that day? And we're told in Isaiah chapter 26, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that 
The righteous nation that keepeth the truth may enter therein. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in Yahweh forever. For in Yah, Yahweh is everlasting strength. That's who goes into the kingdom. The righteous nation. If we want to be in the kingdom, we have to engage in the refining process now and get rid of all the dross. Israel goes through the same process, and two-thirds are cut off and die, but a third are refined and brought through the fire and enter into the kingdom as a righteous nation. Impossible, you say? Well, sure it is from man's point of view, but then it's impossible to save you and me too. But God's word is able to accomplish what he has sent it forth to do. And so that's what will happen. It's put a little differently when we come to the Psalms. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is Yahweh's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas. He hath established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend to the hill of Yahweh? Or who will stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn, sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. We can't be chasing after vanity, brothers and sisters, and hope to be in the kingdom of God. We can't be deceitful with one another. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. There's no twisting and turning and sort of, you know, moving the pea around under the nut and, you know, you kind of lose track of where it is and, oh, I lift it up and it's not there anymore. We have to be honest with one another. We have to be truthful, not swear deceitfully. I mean, it's all through the New Testament. He tells us, don't lie, but do the truth. Well, why does he say that to the saints? Because we are susceptible to it. It's our nature. So we have to be honest with one another, and we have to be honest with our God. Because the wonderful thing is, brothers and sisters, that if we do that, and if we manifest the character, because that's our job, is to teach other people that character, then we will be part of the resilient splendor of the kingdom age. Come to Revelation chapter 10. See, Revelation chapter 10 is the vision of the rainbowed angel. And it's the vision of the rainbowed angel that brings some of these things to light, pardon the pun. So you have there in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow is upon his head. Well, that reminds us of the vision of Revelation chapter 4, right? And chapter 5, there's one on a throne, he's got a cloud all around him, and there's a rainbow around his head, right? And it's the cloud of witnesses. What is he described as? His face is, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Burning pillars of fire. What were the feet of the man of one light? They were fiery, burning brass, right? Burnished brass. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he cries, seven thunders utter their voices. So this is the picture that we have, this revelation of this new one man from heaven who is going to subdue the whole world. And it's given to us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 as well, or chapter 1, sorry, in verse 7. You who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven, with all his mighty angels are going to come with him, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from... The presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints. He comes to be apocalypsed is the word for revealed in 602 there. It's the Greek word 602, Strong's number. In his saints, his agalos, the messengers or the envoys, the ones who are sent. That, brothers and sisters, is us. He comes to be revealed in us, the glory of his power being glorified in his saints. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, is are we doing what we can do now to manifest that glory in our lives? Because he's going to come, as he says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 
in verse 1. It's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gathering of us together to him. It's going to not happen, though, until the falling away takes place first, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That's, of course, the Catholic system that's been in place for a long time now that we're exhorted to come out of. But he says that it's this system whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth, we'll look at that tomorrow, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And the thing we've got to get through our minds, brothers and sisters, is to be qualified to be part of this destruction of flesh in the kingdom age. We have to destroy it in our own lives now. I can't destroy it in your life. You can't destroy it in mine. We have to examine ourselves and deal with that now. We have to be glorifying our, our Lord and our Father because he's coming, and the word there is perusa, the idea of the arrival, the advent, or the visible return. Now, interestingly enough as well, um, there's one other element we're going to try and squeak in. I think we've got time to do it. And that is... In Daniel chapter 10 and verse 6, his body is described as being like beryl. And this one is a bit of an anomaly, a bit of a squeezer for your mind to try and get your head around at first. Because what does that mean? Um, I knew somebody named Beryl. I had a great aunt named Beryl. And uh, that was about the sum total of my understanding of the word at one point. So you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, and it tells you it's Strong's number 8658. It's the word Tarshish. Well, that's helpful. Um, a precious stone or a semi-precious gem, perhaps a chrysolite, yellow jasper, or a yellow-colored stone. Brown Driver Briggs says it's a precious stone, perhaps yellow jasper, or some other gold-colored stone. So several of them seem to concur that the idea is of a goldish, um, and one actually puts it as, as a uh, light green, and the idea is of a new little shoot popping out of the earth. So you think of, you know, you remove a stone, and there's the grass that grows under that stone as it's coming out, and that sort of goldish yellow part of the grass as it's coming up, that's the new growth. That's the idea behind the barrel. But, you know, sometimes it's helpful to get a, a more of a, a scriptural definition, um, so we say, well, where else is this word used? It comes up in Ezekiel 30, or 28, verse 13, and it describes there every precious stone which you're covering. And there's the sardis and the topaz, the diamond, which we would know, and the beryl. The beryl is also a precious stone that is a covering. And the word there for precious, and I apologize, it's so small on the bottom there, but it's the word yakar, which means a valuable, prized, weighty, or precious, rare, splendid, costly stone or jewel, right? So this is the idea. Well, where else does it show up? Well, the barrel to which his body is likened shows up in Ezekiel, or Exodus chapter 28, verse 15, when he's told, thou shalt make a breastplate of judgment with cunning work, the fourth row is going to have a barrel in it, an onyx, a jasper, to be set in gold in their enclosing. So this is the fourth row, right? And of course, Hebrew, it's left to right when you list something off. So it's the one on what we're looking at is the bottom right. He says that fourth row is going to have a barrel. So it's one of the stones that was in the breastplate, which represented, of course, one of the tribes. So we say, okay... Where else does this idea of a precious stone, which is how it was defined in Ezekiel 28, how does that, uh, or, uh, yeah, it was Ezekiel, what was it? Just a minute. It was, yeah, it was Ezekiel 28, I think. Um, how is this used elsewhere? Well, if you come to um, 2 Samuel 12, verse 30, they take the king's, king's crown, they're going to give it to David, off the head of the king, it's the weight is a talent of gold, and it's got precious stones. That's the same idea here, these precious stones that are used. And of course, God's word is likened to the same concept in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Remember when Samuel was ministering before Eli, the word of Yahweh was 
precious in those days. There was no open vision. So this is that same word that's used in Ezekiel, describing a barrel as being a precious stone. It's precious stones, but it's also the precious word of God. And of course, we looked at this yesterday, Proverbs 3, happy is the man who finds wisdom and gets understanding because it's better than gold and so on. She's more precious than jewels. Nothing can be compared with her. So this idea of a precious stone is one that is likened to the word of God. We also looked at this passage yesterday, and that's Lamentations 4 and verse 1. He talks about the precious sons of Zion. So the saints are supposed to be like the precious stones of Zion, or the precious sons of Zion. And of course, there's a play on word there, because stones is eben, or our sons is ben, which is related to the word eben, which of course is the word stone, stone and son being related together, same root word. So we think of that and we say, okay, let's just extrapolate this forward. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, he says, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So Isaiah 28, 16 tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is a precious cornerstone. And we say, okay, well, that makes sense. We looked at the fact that, you know, he was the living stone yesterday with the eyes. But come to Malachi chapter 3, because this is a concept we're not unfamiliar with. Malachi chapter 3 tells us about the saints. He tells us about those who fear Yahweh. In chapter 3 and at verse 16, They that feared Yahweh spake often one to another, and Yahweh hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahweh, and thought upon his name. Well, what's his name? Well, we just looked at that. His name is his ways, is his glory, is his character, is walking in the truth. It's all those things. So these are the people that are engaged in that. They shall be mine, saith Yahweh of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels. That's the same concept that's laid out for us here, the precious jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. So that's the way the saints are described. They are precious jewels, like the barrel. And of course, we know this. I mean, it's, it's there for us. The word jewels here is this word uh, segula, which basically means um, a precious treasure, something that's shut up, something that is kept. Remember we were talking about the vault the other day? And where do we keep our valuables? It's related to this. This is kind of the Hebrew equivalent or similar to it. Something that you would shut away and that you would hide and that you would hold on to. Well, Exodus chapter 19, verse 15. Israel is told, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, a special treasure Ab unto all, above all people, for all the earth is mine. And this idea comes up in Deuteronomy 7, 6, 14, 2, 26, 18, and so on and so forth. But that's the idea. It's what is valued. God values the people who hear his voice and keep his covenant and speak often one to another. It makes him happy. And it's something he wants to hold onto. And he wants to keep those things. They're not just like dirt and rocks as you're walking along the road. We used to, when I was a young boy, go gold panning, you know, and you would sift through all kinds of dirt and rocks living in Kamloops, right? And all this dirt and mud, you'd dump it in, and you'd run water over it, and it would wash away all the mud, and all the gold and jewels and gems would all fall down to the bottom, and you'd sit there and collect them all. And we hoarded together treasures, and a thief broke through and stole them all, and that was the end of that. So... <laughs> This is what we're supposed to be, though, is the real gems, the things that we, we search out God's word. And that's not just Israel, although it certainly is Israel. Yahweh, we read in Psalm 135, verse 4, has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his peculiar treasure. Same words there used again. It's got to be ringing a bell by now to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen generation, 
a royal priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, kings and priests, a holy nation, a peculiar people. He's quoting back from that Exodus verse. That you should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. And sometimes you read that last part fast. Why are we a peculiar people? Why are we a special treasure to God? That, and that's one of those words you want to sort of circle. There's a point to it. It's not just saving the world, right? Remember what Brother Thomas said? God manifestation, not human salvation, is the grand purpose of the eternal spirit. Well, here it's laid out. The reason that we're special jewels that he's going to hold on to is that we would show forth the praises of him who is called you out of darkness, where to? His marvelous light. What are we looking at right now? The man of one. His countenance shining as the sun and his body like precious jewels, the barrel. The word praises, if you look at your margin, is the word virtues or characteristics. This is the purpose of God, to fill the earth with the knowledge the experiential knowledge of his character as the waters cover the sea. All those things come together in the symbology that we are looking at together. And so, brothers and sisters, you know, this idea goes right through into the kingdom of God. Remember what it says the Lord Jesus Christ, he's a precious cornerstone? Well, he's not the only precious stone, because in Revelation 21, in verses 10 to 11, he carried me away in spirit, so there he is taken up into the vision, to a great high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending from God, from heaven, uh, out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Now, this is symbolic language. There's no, you know, mile-wide cube that's going to come thudding down to the earth and, and anything like that. This is symbolic language, and what it means is that the kingdom temple and the higher level is made up of the saints who are living stones, the Lord Jesus Christ being the chief precious cornerstone. And they are all gathered together there as the new Jerusalem, having the glory of God. And her light was like to a stone most precious. That's what the new Jerusalem is. A light stone, one that reflects the light. I mean, that's what makes gems attractive to the magpies and to the sisters probably i don't know you know like it's it's got a sparkly look to it right so it it attracts us right and this is the idea here it reflects the light and it looks really cool that's what god wants is a reflection of his character that's what interests him and this city of course has 12 foundations and in the midst of them the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb so we're all part of that precious city that is like a gem, has the names of the apostles written on them. It's not just them. I mean, remember we read in Revelation 3, 21, it's the saints, all of us together. And the foundations are all garnished with precious stones, verse 19. And the eighth of those precious stones, verse 20, is a barrel. So what a beautiful picture we have that the body is like a barrel. It is a precious stone. That's what God has done. He has gathered together out of the muck of the world a whole bunch of gems and put them together in buckets that we call ecclesias. And, you know, they get tumbled. You know, I don't know if you've ever done any gem tumbling. They get tumbled over and over, bust off all the little rough edges. And sometimes we think, well, you know, I don't like brother so-and-so. Tough. He's been put in this ecclesia for you so that it will help you bust off those rough edges that you need to bust off. And you're there to help bust off the rough edges that he needs to bust off till you become polished and shined. He has put every member into the ecclesia as it pleases him. They're gems, precious gems. Is that how we view one another, brothers and sisters? Do we value each other? Are we not willing that any should perish? Is it acceptable to us that anybody is lost? Because it's not acceptable to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not acceptable to God. He's not willing that any should perish. 
They are precious gems, and he's collecting them to make up the jewels of the kingdom of God. We need to value each other, brothers and sisters, a whole lot more than we do. Yes, we may have rough edges. That's why we're here together, to help work those things out one with another. There's one other aspect of the barrel, um, and I'm out of time, but we're going to throw this up anyway. One other aspect of the barrel, and that is, it's that light green color, the color of a, a little green shoot. Um, because it's not only is it a jewel, but it's the color of the newness of life. So Romans 6 verse 4, we're supposed to be walking in newness of life. That's also the idea expressed by this. Putting on the new man, Ephesians 4 and verse 24, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So that's the picture we have of the barrel. It is a yellowish green stone, the color of a new shoot or a plant signifying new growth. It's the color that represents the new man or the man of one of Daniel chapter 10. It's the color of the wheels of the cherubim. We actually didn't get into this one, signifying walking in newness of life. And it's also the idea of the precious jewels and signifies those who are precious to the father, his treasure that he will use to make up his crown. What a high calling we have, brothers and sisters. Let's value one another, and let's work with our Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ in preparing ourselves and our children and our brothers and sisters to be part of the kingdom of God.